Thank you, Ron. Does anybody have the post-holiday blues today besides Sandy? <laughs> uh, it's always a rush to get to Christmas and get through Christmas and all of the songs and, and sometimes how uh, after Christmas maybe the songs don't seem quite as uh, perfect and, and the lights don't seem quite as bright, I don't know. But uh, some of us uh, have those what's called the holiday blues. And in our text today in Matthew, there certainly is no uh, after Christmas glow uh, with this uh, text. No Christmas glow because in Matthew, uh, there's a story that was just read. And <clears throat> for Matthew, it was a fulfillment of Scripture. For Mary and Joseph, it was a moment of terror. And for the little town of Bethlehem, it was a tragedy of historical proportions. And as we think about this story, um, we hear these words that are echoed from the Old Testament. A voice is heard in Rama, lamentation and wailing, Rachel weeping for her children, and she cannot be consoled, for they are no more. You know, it just seems to me that tragedies ought to wait to after Christmas. The tragedies ought to wait to January before they happen. Because the story of Herod doesn't seem to fit in this Christmas story. This story doesn't seem to fit our picture of Christmas, and it doesn't seem to match the Christmas story. And it would be good if we could just postpone all the things until after Christmas. When we think about this story, we think about the tragedies that go on in our world, and we think, why? You know, and can't we just wait? And, you know, this is not a story we normally like to think of at Christmas and celebrate at Christmas. When we have our Christmas pageants, one of the hardest characters to portray that we normally don't is Herod. You know, we don't have any Christmas cards with Herod on the picture of them. And we don't sing Christmas carols with these themes of, of Herod and the lamentation and wailing that went on. But maybe we should. Maybe we should. I, I think we have to understand that we need to keep Herod in Christmas because we need to be reminded that in the time of Jesus, that at the time of Jesus, on the first Christmas, that there was wailing, that there, was te there were tears, that there was sorrow, there was violence in the world. And we think about this terrible story, but it is part of the Christmas story. Whether we want to admit it or think about it or not. You know, last week we had the blue Christmas service. And... Uh, one of our other, other daughter-in-laws were here. Uh, Allison and Jared were here. And we didn't know that she was going to be here. Uh, as you may know, she lost her uh, mother this year and had to celebrate the first Christmas without her mother. And I noticed during the service that, that there were some tears uh, from her coming down in her eyes. And I, I asked her, uh, we had dinner later, uh, and I asked her about the service and her feelings, and she said, you know, I've been trying to put it off and not think about it, and this service forced me to think about it. But she said, I think it was good. It was good to, to get my feelings out and, and to recognize that. And, uh, and so at least for her, it was, it was a part of a healing time, and I hope that for others it was as well. And some of you that are here that have lost loved ones, uh, I know we don't like to think about these things. We like to think about uh, the, the Hallmark Christmas and, and everything is wonderful and, and it's always a happy ending and we realize that all is not right in our world today. That in the midst of all the wonderful things that we can talk about, that there is tragedy and there are things going on today uh, as we think about our own lives our own struggles, 
each and every one of us. We have stories. We have things going on in our lives that we wish were better or, or we could fix. And then we look around us and we can always see people who have it maybe even worse. People uh, on Christmas, as I worked uh, half a day on Christmas at the hospital, you know, the hospital doesn't close down at Christmas. We can't say, well, we're just going to go home, everybody go home, because you've got people that are sick. And on Christmas Day, I want you to know that there were people who passed away. And at the same time, there were new lives being born. So there were tears of joy and tears of sorrow. And I imagine that's probably true for a lot of us this year, that we have in that tears of joy and tears of sorrow. And, and uh, as we think about uh, all that's going on in, in our world today, uh, I think sometimes we have a tendency to do one or two things. One is that we, uh, we make everything a tragedy. Everything becomes a tragedy. And in CPE, when I was going to chaplain school, there was a word that we used for that. It was called catastrophizing. And catastrophizing is when you... Uh, you know, we have a tendency to do this sometimes. It's, we take something and, and it becomes much, we make it much worse than it actually is. Catastrophizing. And so we have a tendency to, to do that to everything. And I'm, we're not real sure why people do that. Perhaps it's a learned mechanism that they learn from their family or others. A coping type of mechanism especially with people who uh, have depression and all these things. We, we tend to catastrophize everything. The other extreme is that we don't live in reality. We, we want to have that perfect Christmas. We want to have that perfect family. We want everything to be perfect. I remember going to Asbury Seminary just for a visit. And it was a tough time in my life where things were not perfect. And this was several years ago uh, before Sandy and I ever met. And I remember going to chapel there at, uh, on the campus and looking around and seeing all these families and all these people who I know people's lives aren't perfect, but it almost looked that way. I saw people sitting with, with their children. I saw people sitting with their families. And I, I can't help but at that moment I was feeling in a little bit of despair, thinking, why can't I have that? Why is my life so messed up and it seemed like everybody else's is going great? I remember walking out of that campus that day almost thinking, I, I can't go here. I, I can't come here with all of the stuff in my life and, and, and all these things that are going on and people here are having this perfect families. And on that campus, a man, another man who was a student there, I don't know why, but the Lord led him, led us together, and we began to talk. And I shared with him my heart and how I felt I was being called to seminary, but things weren't wonderful. And he prayed with me on that campus. And I did end up going to seminary and finishing seminary. But I understand that sometimes that in our lives we realize that we forget about all the people that have it so difficult, even more than us. And we kind of go through Christmas as if everything is perfect. Growing up in a home with an alcoholic father, I never knew what Christmas was going to be like. If dad came home sober, it could be a good Christmas. If he came home drunk, it could be a terrible Christmas. I remember one particular Christmas that uh, it wasn't a good one. And uh, we didn't have hardly anything under the tree that year. Dad was a gambler, too, so he lost a lot of his money. And if it wasn't for my grandma, we'd have probably starved. And I remember going to the home of my uncles. And they only had two kids. And there were four of us at the time, four children. And I walked in their home, and underneath the tree was more presents than you could count. I never saw so many presents that went all around that tree and it kind of filled up the room. And it just made me feel empty because I knew we weren't going to get 
maybe anything that year. And here's why I say this, that in the midst of all these terrible things that are going on in the world, we need to hear the story of Herod. We need to keep Herod in Christmas because I believe it is a part of Christmas. Is that rain? What is? Okay. I didn't plan that, but it's, if we think about the world in which we live, we understand that it's not yet what God wants it to be. We have not arrived yet, but we're looking for a place, and we're going to a city whose builder and maker is God. And we have hope. And as a Christian, even though we have sometimes where things happen that are tragedies. It happened on that first Christmas. Remember the thing that happened that was most important. A little baby was born, which would bring hope to a world that seemed hopeless. In a world of tragedy, a wonderful thing occurred one night. Jesus was born. There was a preacher that told the stories from South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina. When he was seven years old, he said he recalled a particular Christmas Eve when he could not go to sleep. He was so excited. And he waited in bed and laid there with his eyes wide open until he heard his parents snoring. And he s slipped down the stairs to where all the Christmas presents were. And there was a drum set there, a toy drum set that was beckoning him to play it, but he knew better. So he began to get into all the presents, and he found his uh, six-shooter and his cowboy outfit and his uh, puppets and began to play with the puppets. And then he got into his stocking and got the candy out of the stocking, the oranges and the apples and the chocolate, and began to eat all those things. Any of you all ever have children do that or ever did that yourself? And that's what was going on. Then all of a sudden, he turned around, and there was his father standing, looking very sternly. And he was very afraid at that moment. But then a big smile came over his dad's face. And he just sat down, his father sat down in the recliner and just listened to him tell about how the six-shooter worked and about how that the, uh, the puppet worked and, and all the things that he had and showed him all the presents. And they had a wonderful time that night in just the private, privacy of their own home, just the father and the son. And then sleep overcame this young boy. And his father picks him up in his arm and carries him back up the stairs to put him to bed. And he said, I'll never forget that Christmas Eve. It was such a wonderful time. Well, several years later went by, and he found himself once again at the side of his father at Christmas. But this time, his father was paralyzed from a, an accident, and he had cancer. And his body was racked with pain, and he was weak. And his father said he wanted to watch all the kids open up the presents, and he asked if he could carry them. And his son helped shave him, get him clean, carried him downstairs, got him ready to watch the, the, the presents being opened. But after a while, he was in so much pain. You see, his cancer had taken a toll on his body, and he had tried treatments. And all of the treatments and the experimental drugs and everything had left him less than 100 pounds, and he was extremely weak. And he began to cry, and he said, take me back to bed. And so his son picks him up, takes him back up the stairs, and it occurred to him as he was carrying him that many, many years ago as a seven-year-old boy, his father had actually carried him. And that memory came back to him, and the emotions came over, and he began to cry. And as the tears came down from his eyes, and he laid his father in the bed, his father saw his tears, and he reached over and pointed to a tape recorder. And the tape recorder had on it the Bible readings. And they listened to the story of John 14. In my father's house are many mansions. And as they listened to that story, this young man, this preacher said he thought to himself and began to pray. And he thanked God for saving his soul. And he thanked God for saving his dad. 
And he thanked God for the hope that he had in his heart to know that there was something better out there. And I want to say to you today that in spite of all the terrible, terrible things that may go on in the world, that may go on in your heart, I want you to know Jesus, Jesus wants you to know that there is a reason to be happy today. That there is a reason to rejoice today. Because He is alive. And he is on the throne, and he loves you so much. He wants to have a relationship with you, and sometimes we may push him away, but he continues to love you. And you know, there are those times, with just like that father carried that little boy, that God will carry you through your own sorrows. Let's pray as the musicians come. Brother Dave comes up and leads us in the song. Dear Father, we understand that life can be difficult for all of us. We understand that it's not all perfect. It's not all rainbows. And you never promised us a perfect life. And just like the rose, every rose has its thorns. And we know, God, that every life has its thorns. And I want to pray today for those that continue to struggle. Life goes on, and everybody seems to go on with their life, but sometimes the world doesn't seem to be what it used to be. I want to pray for each and every person here that's struggling right now. God, that you would strengthen them. And God, it may not happen overnight. But God, that healing would begin to take place in their life and continue, that they would continue to heal both physically, emotionally, and spiritually. I want to pray your will be done. In Christ's name, amen.